Our topic today is uh, technology and innovation. If we think of technology as, as a means or a, a tool and innovation as a process, the question is, what is our goal? And looking at the panel and discussing what we're really interested in, I think sustainability, environmental sustainability, is very clear as a common goal, and especially an issue that both Japan and the United States are facing in a very dramatic way. We have today among our uh, speakers in this panel uh, people who have done uh, work on the environment, innovation, and technology in a number of different ways. We have variety. Uh, we also have people that are working in a number of different countries, spanning all the way from uh, Europe and the OECD through China, uh, Japan, and uh, obviously the United States. What I'd like to do uh, by way of uh, opening the panel is just having uh, each of the uh, speakers introduce their research and their interests. Um, we'll go on then from expertise and interest to the issue of the major problem in a second round, and then talk briefly about solutions before we go on to the wider discussion. Uh, again, technology, innovation, and sustainability are uh, what we're interested in. Um, we're going to be looking towards the end at finally cooperation between uh, Sophia and Georgetown on these issues. So if we could begin just uh, with a, a brief introduction. This is uh, Professor uh, uh, Takashi Inohara, Sophia University Department of Information and Communication Sciences. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Takashi. Thank you for the kind of introduction. Um, uh, I'm doing research in the industrial engineering. Um, more specifically, I'm doing research about the manufacturing systems and supply chain management. And later, I'll uh, talk about uh, global supply chain management considering the environmental issues. So first, I'll briefly mention about our uh, production systems. For making our product, uh, basically we need uh, two design. One is a product design. Uh, in this uh, process, in, in these uh, designs, we need our, uh, each specific technology like uh, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, or chemical engineering, and so on. After that, for making uh, uh, millions of products uh, for efficient production, we need a uh, process design, good process designs. In this design, we use uh, industrial engineering. Um, for example, uh, to uh, design our, our factory or plants, uh, we have to decide how many and what kind of machines are, are used, should be used. And after that, we have to de uh, decide the uh, arrangement or layout of machines. And after that, um, we, uh, at, at that process, we have to consider the um, efficient material flow to minimize the lead time or uh, amount of inventory at each uh, process. And uh, after that, we have to decide the production planning or production scheduling and so on. Uh, so for those manufacturing technologies, uh, Japan has a quite a high uh, level. As, uh, as many of you know, that the Toyota production system, that is characterized as a just-in-time production. Uh, just-in-time, is, which means, uh, uh, more correct English is just on time, but uh, JIT mm -hmm. is, uh, mm -hmm. I guess, a very famous uh, name for uh, um, expressing the Toyota production system. In that system, um, their read time is quite short. Read time is a time length from the uh, customer order to the uh, delivery to the uh, customers. That read time is quite short, even though their amount of inventory is quite less. It's quite difficult. If we have a lots of inventory, then quite easy to uh, sell the customer in a short return because if we have a, a final product, then the customer orders, then just we uh, pass it. But if we do not have an inventory, then we have to make it after we get uh, uh, customer orders. So we ha we need a long read time, right? So they, they, they realized or they solved that uh, uh, trade-off <laughs> problem. Uh, without having a lots of inventory and the lead time is very short. 
so for those kind of um, uh, uh, decisions, they have a very good and high uh, level uh, of uh, design abilities. Um, industrial engineering is that it, it, uh, those areas. I'm doing uh, the research in this area, and as my research, I build up a mathematical model to uh, express those manufacturing systems, and I uh, propose uh, optimization uh, technology or optimization algorithm to solve the problem, and uh, um, I use uh, like operation research technique, uh, mathematical optimization technique, or simulation technique by using a computer uh, analysis. Uh, th that is my uh, research area about uh, production systems. Very good, very good. <laughs> and here we are in the business school. We should use their language a bit. We call this supply chain management for those of you who are in the business school. Of course, the issue is basically how you actually create a product and bring it to market. And Professor works a lot on the supply chains actually between China and uh, Japan. We'll be looking at those as we go on to talk. But I'll bet if I asked where are your clothes coming from? Many of you probably would say they're actually coming from China through the supply chain that Professor has just explained. So let's go on. Professor, could you continue there, Professor? Thank Falcon. you very much. I'm very much honored to be here with a prominent people <clears throat> as well as promising students. I learned uh, President Obama made a speech here in the Georgetown University. I'm particularly delighted because he started his speech with what happened on my third birthday. If you're not familiar with what happened on my third birthday, visit Georgetown's uh, homepage. It is gorgeous. President will explain it to you. Anyway, um, actually, I categorize myself as a disappointed economist. And uh, I started my career as a governmental official working for Ministry of Environment, or say a little more than 20 years ago. And my job mostly was to prepare and uh, submit this labor intensive report called environmental white paper. Usually people, I say, graduate this job after two years of their services. But unfortunately, I had a very bad boss who liked me. And uh, <laughs> in the end, I prepared seven, eight report. You know. And good news here is we have English version. This is my choice of uh, pictures. You might have seen this. Ito Jakchu. And instead of writing the title of this book, I, I just put nothing so that you can enjoy the, this beautiful picture. If you like, I might uh, leave it to Georgetown University. Thank you. OK. So um, my area of interest is like a sustainability of human beings. In ancient times, the, the global environment impact caused by human beings might be little less or not exceed the capacity of the Earth. And the natural processes called regeneration or self-purification. But we can assume those days that it was a primitive sustainable society. Now, in this primitive sustainable society, human impact were enough small, and the various home of wisdom, including local knowledge, traditional rules, and re religious taboos. At, as the time passed, humans have overcome the various problems for social and economic development through the progress in technology and social systems. However, the technological and systematic changes were so tremendous that I think humans could not really accumulate and utilize the wisdom using new technology and new systems. For instance, the industrial revolution uh, has introduced mass production, mass consumption that led the mass waste, which is a new problem, as you know. In a modern society, mainly in developed nations, there has been a remarkable increase of economic wealth and more people are materia materially satisfied, while economic inequality are growing and quite a few people struggle with poverty. Without preser preserving natural resources and energy and without putting them steadily into economic and social activities, human cannot achieve social, economic, and environmental sustainability. Therefore, the task for us 
is to use natural resources energy efficiently, conserving the Earth's environment within the capacity of Earth's regeneration and self-purification. So my concerns are about the issue that limited resources and energy might not be able to support human life and economic activities because of rapid growth of our population. We might come this as a quiz in the second round. And I'm interested in the recent uh, development in the new indicators. As we learned that GDP is uh, a lot of uh, lacks, I mean, uh, uh, not, not uh, perfectly well. Like if you compare country A and country B, with uh, country A with more uh, unhealthy people and if other conditions are almost the same, then country A apparently shows higher GDP because of medical fee or whatever. So instead of this uh, GDP, uh, around uh, 2007, well, there was a several movement before, but in the recent movement around uh, since 2007, there is a movement to uh, set a new indicators, GDP and beyond. And uh, this is one of the uh, uh, movement which I'm uh, watching rather cautiously. I, I tell you the reason later. And the another movement is to introduce a policy tool called or a sustainable impact assessment. If you're interested in environmental policies, you might have heard uh, environmental impact assessment, which is now evolved, evolved to the strategic environmental assessment. And now it's sustainable impact assessment. So I'm also interested in this uh, new uh, policy screening tool. Well, I finally, I would like to mention a bit about the uh, easy figures. Proven reserves divided by yearly consumption. That will give you the, say, lifelong of the metro resources. That will be 20 years for silver and gold, 35 years for copper, 70 years for iron. Well, this is just a calculation. And it means if we do not find new iron ore or whatever, it might happen. But usually we find a little more. And other precious metals like crumbs, 15 years, and lots of very important uh, precious metals are coming uh, life expectancy at within or 50, say 40, 50 years. So uh, I'm very much interested in how we could uh, change the facing uh, course for the whole human society. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Joanna Lewis, Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. Hi. Um, Nice to see you all this afternoon. Um, so I'm a professor in the School of Foreign Service in a program called Science, Technology, and International Affairs. Um, and this is a somewhat unique program at Georgetown as well as at, at many universities in that it combines uh, training in science, technology, with training in the social sciences and international affairs. Um, this has been an enjoyable place for me because this very much actually matches my own academic background and training. Uh, which is a combination of the, the natural sciences, environmental science, um, engineering, as well as uh, international and political affairs. And my own work focuses primarily in China. Um, my research looks at uh, essentially how countries are transitioning to lower carbon economies and the pathways through which this can occur. Um, I base my work primarily in China because, as many of you know, China is the largest energy consumer in the world and currently the largest carbon dioxide emitter, uh, one of the major greenhouse gases we, we care about for uh, global climate change. And uh, not only is China one of the biggest uh, contributors to our global environmental burden, but it's really one of the places where we have, uh, where there's a real opportunity to uh, change the pathway through which the country is building out its infrastructure. Um, and as well as its energy systems. Uh, so my work looks at particularly how China is adopting cleaner energy technologies in a variety of areas. Uh, and a recent uh, book, book project looked particularly at this question of green innovation in China and to the extent uh, to which China is not only starting to deploy cleaner energy technologies, but is also becoming a leading manufacturer of these technologies and increasingly an innovator in these technologies as well. So there's, of course, a common belief that China, most of China's technologies come from other countries. They're initially 
uh, innovated, developed in Japan or the United States or uh, within Europe. And to, for the most part, this has been the case uh, in recent history. Um, but we've seen a real change in these uh, models of technology transfer and acquisition in the emerging world uh, in that you no longer just have China um, and other emerging economies playing catch up to uh, state of the art technologies that were developed in, in the industrialized world, but are now beginning to become leaders in some of these forefront technologies. And, and this is actually, of course, has a whole broad set of international uh, questions about globalization, about competitiveness. Um, but also, I think, has some real positive sides in terms of the entry of China into these sectors in bringing down the costs of a lot of the clean energy technologies, which not only China will need going forward, but also all, everyone is going to need going forward, be it solar panels or uh, carbon capture sequestration technologies, which we'll talk about later. Um, so I look at a variety of issues related to uh, technology development as well as the broader uh, political and uh, policy models that uh, China, as well as other countries, are using to deploy and, and promote clean energy technology industries. This panel uh, spans uh, many countries because the uh, environmental issue, unlike a single country problem or even a bilateral problem, is very much a regional uh, issue, of course, a global issue today. And certainly a very, very important regional issue, both in Northeast Asia and Southeast Asia. You've heard of Southeast Asia with the forest burnings and the problems that it's causing for Singapore, Thailand and such. Um, but even more so in Northeast Asia, uh, living in Beijing, you have pollution, but living in Seoul, you also have pollution that's coming over from, from China, as well as uh, your pollution coming uh, into Japan. So this becomes a regional issue in which you have to put aside some of your regional animosities in order to actually address an issue which is critical to all three. Uh, continuing that theme, let's just talk briefly about what are the issues, what are the, the serious issues in terms of the environment that each of you are dealing with. Maybe we'll just begin with Professor Kawakami just giving us a broader sense of where we were yesterday. So what happened yesterday? Well, I, I know you are a great guesser, you know, uh, at Belitis. Yesterday we had, of course, the great uh, Senator Dashiell full eye, actually, I say, speeches like uh, impressive, inspiring, infinite, and I love that, actually. <laughs> but uh, just uh, set aside, and uh, if you can imagine, we welcome 370,000, what? Newborn babies in a single day. Unfortunately, we've had to make a farewell to 150,000, but still human beings increased its population as much as 200,000, which means within a week, we're going to have one million people. So you can imagine establishing this uh, like it was in terms of size or capital or producing, produced you know, every week. And our next figure is about resources, about uh, sand, gravel, stones, and so on. We excavated about 60 million tons of those uh, sand, stones, and whatever, which is equivalent to at the size of the mountain with uh, a thousand meter in a single day. This is what happened. And also if I use the number of automobiles produced, <coughs> it's 200,000, while we're abolishing 120,000. So it's a bit to consume in society. If I name uh, waste as the next example, we produced 35, million tons of waste. So this is what happened in a single day. If you are a lucky but busy space traveler, that would be you would observe what happened on Earth. And suppose if you are very, very lucky enough to stay and observe what happened on the Earth a hundred years, what would you see? Yes, of course, you would see uh, the uh, centennial event, but <laughs> if you really 
focusing on what nature produced. It's just one centimeter thick soil. Nature took a hundred years to produce one centimeter soil. And if you're lucky enough to stay several thousand years on Earth, then you would see formation of rich forest. That's the magnitude of what nature produces and what our human beings consume in a, you know, our, on Earth. So my question in total would be, are we sustainable? Thank you. Wow, very good. Do you want to continue on the main, main problem, the central problem that you're finding in your research? Mm -hmm. Okay, I mentioned about the global supply chain management problem now concerning about the environment. In the traditional research, in the supply chain management, the, the main objective function is minimizing the invent, amount of inventory or minimizing the lead time and so on. But recently, we are, as we are mentioning that we have to consider about the environment problem. So in my particular problem, I had a, a joint research with a company that is a textile industries. We are uh, not making the, those uh, across in, inside Japan, but outside Japan. In that case, uh, manufacturing sites are located in China, Shanghai. Then uh, we are importing those groceries from Shanghai to uh, mainly their uh, big uh, demand bases at Tokyo area, Osaka area, and Kyushu areas. In that supply chain uh, problems, um, at first for uh, uh, overseas transportation from Shanghai to Japan, then they have two choices. One is the air, uh, airplane, by airplane. The other one is uh, by a ship. When we think about the lead time, of course, uh, airplanes much, much faster than using a uh, ship. But when we consider about the uh, carbon uh, dioxide emissions, uh, then uh, airplane emit lots of CO2. So in that sense, ship is much better, but longer lead time. So uh, we have to choose which is better. If the demand is uh, very stable, then we can uh, order uh, earlier than the due date. Then uh, uh, we can use a longer uh, read time by using a SIP. But if the um, uh, demand is very, very fluctuated, then uh, we have to use a sh uh, airplane. So the good combination is necessary. And also for the domestic transportation, we can add other uh, carrier like a truck or the uh, uh, train. Um, regarding the lead time, truck and train is almost the same, but the flexibility is quite different. For truck, at any time we can start and uh, arrive at the uh, destination, but for the flight train, uh, in Japan, of course in many countries, a passenger train is uh, a higher priority, so in the morning and in, uh, in the evening, like a rush hour, then a flight train cannot pass, so cannot, cannot move, so only at the midnight or the daytime, only, only in those uh, time periods the train goes. So, uh, train has less uh, flexibilities. In that sense, uh, truck is uh, better. Um, but of course, as you know, the truck emits a much more CO2 uh, compared with the train. So uh, there is uh, here uh, another uh, uh, choosing problems. So, uh, and also, we have to uh, decide the combination of each other. If we uh, transport uh, order by order, then we have to emit lots of CO2. So we need to combine uh, several orders together to, to transport. But uh, for each uh, option, each, each order's um, due date is different and the destination, uh, like a Tokyo, Osaka, or some other places, so destination uh, location is different. So uh, by considering those, pro, uh, those um, aspects, it becomes a quite difficult problem, as I mean uh, mathematically. So I build up a mathematical model to solve the problem and I found a good um, uh, solutions, not only for the lead time, inventory, or total cost, but also considering the um, environmental cost, like emission of CO2. That is my um, uh, uh, global supply chain uh, problem uh, regarding the uh, environment. And it uh, brings up the issue that uh, these environmental concerns are not simply the concern of the producer, they're the concern of the consumer. Are you willing to have uh, your sweater arrive one day later at the store on behalf of reducing that carbon footprint in the transportation system. The choice between a truck that can deliver a specialized good overnight 
versus a train that can't deliver it for two days is a big choice for a consumer, a big choice for a, a retailer. And that brings up the question of where the consumer stands in the choices for the carbon footprint. Not the producer, but the consumer. Joanna, do you want to continue on what you see as some of the main issues, the main problems that we're facing in terms of the environment? Well, I think that um, I mean the real challenge that really drives a lot of my work and that I think is the the big problem that's encompassing a lot of the issues that we're touching on here is that of global climate change. Uh, I mean, we now have overwhelming scientific evidence that human activity is changing the climate system, and a lot of this is driven by the way our energy systems are structured. Um, and uh, I think the real challenge going forward is thinking about how our societies are going to be able to continue to power our economies in a way that is uh, less destructive for the environment. And this is, of course, uh, much uh, easier said than done, but there's, a, I think, a variety of very um, uh, complicated trade-offs that we're going to have to think about, some of which have been mentioned already. But, um, you know, really we're looking at a set of technology options balanced against economic variables. Uh, what's it going to cost us? What are the environmental benefits? What are the trade-offs? And how does uh, climate change itself um, relate to a whole set of other broad international challenges that we're dealing with. So um, I often uh, he hear this uh, discussion, particularly in the security community um, here in the U.S., which is in the last few years become particularly concerned about global climate change, which might seem surprising that the, the security community would be interested in the environmental issue, but really this is something that's becoming a, a threat multiplier in that a lot of the challenges that already exist, which may be environmentally driven, um, but can be shown to have a direct national security impact will actually be exacerbated by a lot of the impacts that are expected uh, to come uh, from climate change. So just to give an example, uh, in China, for example, where I work, uh, much of northern China is a desert, uh, is very water scarce. Um, there's a real shortage. They, China spends a lot of time, a lot of engineering, uh, moving water from places that have it to places that don't have it. Um, and this is a uh, this is a security issue for the country because water, of course, is extremely important for the still heavily agricultural driven economy. Um, it's important for the energy sector. Hydropower still plays an important role in China, um, as well as uh, water is used in almost everything you can think of in terms of uh, coal power, for example. Water plays an important role. Nuclear power needs to have water sources. So this is something that's very much you know, tied to ener any energy uh, choice, essentially, that the country makes, let alone all the other more traditional uses we, we of course, have for water. Um, and so the, some of the scenarios uh, of what scientists are predicting will happen under warming are, you know, exacerbated drought conditions. Um, you're even going to see extreme flooding events, but that water is not necessarily water that can be captured because it doesn't go into the groundwater system. Um, so I mentioned this as an example, but I think that, you know, climate change is really, you can think of this as sort of the, the quintessential um, global challenge in that it's, uh, it's at the heart of our economic um, decision making. It's at the heart of our environmental problems, our energy security challenges, um, and broader challenges going forward. Um, we've talked about some of the issues, some of the major problems, um, and I want to get to, as soon as we can to the to the discussion, especially the student questions. Um, but I would like to leave us on a more positive note about what have been some solutions that you each see that, uh, especially recent policy uh, suggestions, recent policy proposals, uh, perhaps any areas of U.S.-Japan cooperation where you see that these two countries, given their tremendous resources for innovation, their tremendous resources for technology, uh, might have a way of addressing some of these issues in a positive way. Professor, you know, how did you want to begin? Uh, can I mention about the uh, collaboration between two universities? Yes, very okay. much. Um, so he's going to start very practically with the university <laughs> level. That's very good. All right. Um, uh, uh, for futures, uh, I'd like to propose our more collaboration between uh, the Georgetown University and the Sophia Universities. Um, so uh, before my uh, proposal that um, 
I uh, direct to briefly explain about the current um, structure of the uh, School or Faculty of Science and Technology in Sofia University. Um, 2000, in 2008, uh, we developed the new uh, department structure in uh, science and technologies. Now we have three uh, uh, departments in the science and technologies. Uh, one is the um, uh, Department of Materials and uh, Life Science. In that department, we have the area of chemistry and applied chemistry and biology. And the second department, the name is Department of Engineering and Applied uh, Science. In this department, we have um, uh, physics, mechanical engineering, and electrical engineering. And finally, in the third department, which I belong, uh, the dep department name is the Department of Information and Communication Sciences. In this department, uh, we have the area of computer science and uh, pure mathematics. Okay. Uh, in those uh, three departments, we are covering uh, most of the uh, science and technologies area, uh, not only science, but also engineering also. And uh, very recently, last year, we set up a new uh, English course uh, in uh, the first department, Department Material and Life Science. We, we, have, uh, we set up a green science course. And the uh, second department, the Department of uh, Engineering and Applied Science, we set up a, a green uh, engineering course. Uh, in both uh, course, uh, courses, uh, we have an English course. You do not have to study Japanese at all for studying uh, those um, areas. And from this year, from this coming uh, autumn, uh, we uh, established um, an English course uh, for the graduate schools, masters and also PhDs. Uh, that's quite new, just uh, from um, this month, from the end of this month, we start the new uh, English uh, uh, graduate course. Okay. And finally, I mentioned about the, um, uh, the proposal. Uh, uh, we just to, I just to have more um, faculty exchange between the Georgetown and um, the Sofia University, especially more in the um, science and technology areas. Uh, if, but if the uh, time period is quite long, then uh, it's quite difficult to go each other so often because we need uh, maybe sabbatical years. So I just propose a short term uh, faculty exchange, like uh, one month or two months at most. Then uh, we can use a summer uh, vacation time or spring uh, vacation time. Uh, we have the, about uh, two months period. So by using those time periods, uh, we uh, e visit each other um, uh, more. And if uh, we, uh, I mean, the faculty uh, have a collaborative, collaborative research uh, each other so much, then uh, maybe after that, uh, the each faculty will dispatch uh, some graduate students and some undergraduate students, and our collaboration will be much, much more stronger. And uh, uh, while we are doing research, maybe we can set up our like academic symposium in each uh, universities. So like that, I would like to continue this uh, great opportunity. And uh, to continue this opportunity, I would like to propose to have a short-term uh, faculty exchange. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent, thank you. Professor Kawakami. Yes, thank you very much. Um, if I could just uh, say, just very briefly, about uh, good news about sustainability before. Um, in, in many OECD countries and EU, um, there is a movement to set up their national strategy for sustainable development, which is integrating economic, environment, and social aspects at the same time. So I, I say, our, I'm going to tell you three alloys for sustainable development. First one is this, SD strategy. And the second one is uh, like an indicator for sustainable development. But actually, there are lots of different indicators are in, invented. And uh, if I j just give one or two examples, uh, like in the United Nations, there is an indicator called HDI, Human Development Indicators. This is actually based on three aspects, economics, education, and life expectancy. But since this is uh, based on the idea of our, our, our scientists from developing countries, this is 
this can't be a goal for developing countries, but most developed countries, like we see the countries, shows full score. So it cannot be the, you know, give a good uh, target for developed countries. And actually, in Japan, we are just modified this HDI and produce our indicators called HEDI, our Human Environment and Development Indicators. And this is the very easy idea, our economic our data divided by CO2 emissions. That would change the ranks of the countries dramatically. Fortunately, Japan got a better number. <laughs> and so uh, if I tell you another indicators, OECD is uh, developing uh, indicators called well-being indicators. This is actually I'm watching with very, uh, I'm, I shouldn't say, but uh, with a cautious. Just tell you one example. There's many aspects like economy or social inclusion or whatever, education. And there's aspects called safety. Among 34 OECD countries, the safest country is, according to this indicator, Canada. Second comes Japan. And the third comes USA. If you're satisfied with this ranking, then it's okay. <laughs> but if you want US government to work more for you know, establishing safer city, this indicator might give a wrong message to you. In this particular OECD indicators, they use self-reported uh, data to give a ranking of the countries. I'm not sure, but uh, maybe our US citizens do not report you know, they are strong enough, so they do not report that I'm the victim of a whatever. So it, it would give her different messages. So like this, there's a lot of our movement to establish sustainable indicators. So strategy, indicators, and finally, as a policy screening tool, I'd like to mention a bit about uh, strategic, uh, sorry, uh, sustainable development or assessment or, impact assessment, I should say. And this is uh, mainly are introduced in EU countries, Belgium, Switzerland, and so on. The idea of which is just long before the government produce it or have a plan, to plan of, or project, they check from social view, economic view, and environmental view. And uh, I remember when our concrete example of the Belgian our application of this uh, policy screening tool. And uh, there was a good uh, project for uh, extending the ski area. But uh, because of, yes, in the economy, it shows plus. But it showed a negative, a little larger than the plus of the economy in the environmental field. So they, they decided not to do this project. So it worked at least in certain companies. So strategy indicators and their impact assessment, these are the three are good measures for changing our direction to in a sustainable way. Okay, and yes, yeah, sorry, as a good cooperation, this is like a on the spot idea and I haven't got any approval from our university, but just uh, I, I cannot resist you know, telling this idea. This is called the Super Eco Campus Project. As a step one, exchange professors and invite exchange professors to uh, something like a committee dealing with energy management in the campus as an observer. And this ask these professors to uh, set a draft of Eco Campus plan. And then maybe as a step two, we could exchange present like a present from Georgetown University to Jochi, like uh, wind turbine generators. Instead, uh, Jochi University would give or Georgetown to give a solar power panel. This is, we really need some symbolic matters to have a good emotion, I, I mean, to be motivated. And third, maybe exchange students or have an add value competition for this uh, Echo Campus plan, and uh, maybe the outstanding student can be you know, really invited to and exchange this universities. There are two aims, two aims. One is for energy dependent or energy sustainable campus to, to establish this one. 
So those energy request required in a university can be totally supplied from those renewables. And the second step is really difficult, and it's not realistic. And I wouldn't say in the Ministry of Environment, but uh, aiming for totally sustainable campus, using sustainably managed wood instead of steel or concrete or whatever. If, it's, if we achieved this, this is really, really a model case for the campus, campus for the maybe our next century. But I'm not sure if it's really feasible or not. Or if I just give a very small ideas, uh, like in the Curitiba in Brazil, the factors of their successful or city management is they started from the very small project so that they learn, they experience a lot. And then this project might have a little or a larger or a magnitude, and then a little more. So maybe we could start with a small project first, like why don't we set in a sustainable clock? Like using the data as I explained to you before. Okay. Or, uh, Sorry. Yes, yes. That's good. Thank you. Uh, I should stop now. Thank we. Those are great ideas, but we're kind of running out of time. Could you continue there, if you would, and what you find is the solutions there? Sure. Um, mm. Maybe I could start big picture and then end with some more concrete ideas. Um, so I've I've laid out a lot of the challenges, and I don't want to to leave this on a negative note. So I thought maybe I could talk a little bit about some of the. Uh, real opportunities I see going forward, um, both for China where I work, which is of course important what China does for all of us, um, but also for Japan, which I, I think at a really interesting time right now in its, its energy um, policy decisions going forward. Um, China is a country that is you know, full of, of real challenges when it comes to energy. It's a very, um, very reliant on coal, uh, the largest coal consumer and producer in the world. Coal contributes about two-thirds of the country's total primary energy consumption, as well as about 80% of electricity generation. Um, so in terms of the environmental challenges China's facing from coal, we all know this. We've read about it on the front page of almost every newspaper over the last year, uh, and the potential health repercussions of uh, the current coal uh, consum the coal combustion there are, are not even going to be fully known for until many years from now. Um, but that said, uh, the, the Chinese government has actually put in place many very aggressive measures to not only diversify away from coal, but to uh, use energy much more efficiently and to promote cleaner sources of energy. Uh, so China is not only the largest consumer of coal in the world, they're actually the largest consumer of wind energy in the world, um, soon to be largest consumer of solar power in the world. Um, and as I mentioned, they're also playing an important role in, in producing these technologies as well. Uh, China actually got more electricity from wind energy last year uh, than it did from nuclear energy, for example, which might be surprising even though uh, China's building nuclear plants quite rapidly. Uh, so what I say, it's the, the, and so it's the third largest source of electricity in China after hydropower and coal. That said, it's still a very small share uh, in terms of only uh, uh, just over a percent. So barely making a dent, but still um, starting to get China on the right track in terms of uh, doing really large scale development of these technologies. 1% in China is still more than any other country in the world, right? So the scale of the, the challenges that this country is facing are really quite large. Um, turning to Japan, I, I think that um, this is really an, a very important uh, crossroads in terms of, China, of Japan's energy policy decisions. And um, I'm, I, of course, am not a, an expert on, on J Japanese policy, but I, as an energy specialist, uh, am looking very closely at what's happening in Japan um, because I think, you know, Ch Japan really is... Um, is an interesting place to study these types of options. As you may know, it has very few domestic energy resources available. Uh, Japan is only about 16% uh, so-called energy self-sufficient in that it is the third largest oil consumer in the world behind the US and China and the third largest net importer of oil. Um, also the world's largest importer of LNG, liquefied natural gas, and the second largest importer of coal. So really heavily dependent on importing energy resources from around the world, um, primarily these fossil energy resources. And so in the wake of, um, of the uh, March 11 incident, thinking about the future of nuclear in China and what other energy um, opportunity, other energy technologies are going to be on the table, I think is a really um, you know, important 
um, decisions are going to be made on this in the coming years. When we think about um, building out energy systems, the biggest uh, sort of the, the worst thing that can happen is to have uncertainty, <laughs> whether it's policy uncertainty, regulatory uncertainty, because the amount of money that um, it takes to invest in these large scale uh, power plants are, is, are quite substantial. And so investors need to have some idea of you know, how much risk is involved and, and how they can plan for these uh, plants that you, know, you build a coal plant, it's going to be there for maybe 30 years, maybe 50 years. Um, and so thinking about these long time horizons for, for investments are really quite important. Um, and I think it's been interesting to see some very, um, very aggressive support of clean energy coming out of Japan in, in the last year. Um, as you may know, um, Japan has recently adopted a feed-in tariff to uh, support several types of renewable energy. This is a policy model that's used in many, many countries around the world um, to uh, set a fixed contract to subsidize renewable electricity. This is used in China. This is used in, in many countries in Europe and, and elsewhere around the world. Um, I actually had a student who traveled around the world last summer on a fellowship looking at different countries' uh, feed-in tariff programs and, and different levels of effectiveness. Um, so it's, it's very interesting to see Japan now adopting this model. Um, but of course, it, it comes with trade-offs. It requires a subsidy. Um, Japan, is uh, the feed-in tariff is, is really quite high, so there's a lot of money at stake. Um, and a lot of decisions that need to be made about, you know, how long do countries want to subsidize renewable energy? I do a lot of work on the, um, the reasons why countries decide to support renewable energy or not to support renewable energy, because of course this takes, um, a, a decision to spend the money on these types of technologies. And often countries are not willing to do this if they don't see a direct benefit to the economy, to the local economy from this. So that often means using technologies that are, are being manufactured in that country. Um, and Japan's actually in a unique situation in this regard as, you know, being uh, home to many of the leading solar manufacturers in the world, even uh, many of the leading wind turbine manufacturers in the world, um, and is, is actually one of the few countries that has had these leading manufacturers and hasn't, you know, had a very large domestic market for these technologies. That's, that's really quite rare because, as I said, many of these manufacturers never actually succeed in the global marketplace if they don't have uh, domestic policy support and a domestic market to start to sell their technologies and, and build this up. Um, so, of course, you know, renewables are one option, but there's many others that are um, under consideration. Um, you know, particularly looking at cleaner fossil energy technologies, shale gas, right, which is the um, the big technology being discussed here in the United States in the wake of uh, many new uh, shale gas resource discoveries. Um, a lot of interest in whether um, the U.S. may eventually export shale gas, but according to you know current projections, it's it probably won't be until at least 2020 where um, U.S. demand. Uh, for natural gas is uh, less than supply and so that we may see excess capacity. Um, and that's not even mentioning the sort of the other uh, trade related constraints potentially surrounding trade in these types of resources. Um, and Joanna, and, maybe yeah. we could leave some of those issues, especially the shale gas, some of those hot button issues, nuclear power in Japan, the choice, uh, the Fukushima reactor. These are all hot button issues and I think this panel is very well prepared to speak on some of those issues and I think jo Joanna has even more there on some of the recent U.S.-Japan agreements on some of these things. But I'd like to get to the students, give you a chance to sort of express what you're seeing in terms of the environment. Uh, keep in mind that uh, for those of us who are older, we're looking to the environment and it's, it's going to change somewhat for us, but it's really going to change for you. So this is really an issue for, for younger people in many ways, and I'd uh, very much welcome your questions and your comments. So again, we have the two microphones, I believe. If you just raise your hand, we'll have someone come with a microphone. So please feel free to participate on any of these particular issues. <clears throat> Hi, thanks for coming. My name is Colin Steele and I work for Georgetown right now. So my question is quite simply, um, actually more of a challenge. I would like to challenge all three of you to speak to the public policy aspect of climate and climate change, because I think um, for better or worse, the burden of proof is on the scientific community to sell, particularly in this country, climate change and response to the public policy community, because we have a situation where we do face a global crisis 
And it's a crisis of building a global imagination as much as it's a crisis of an actual impending event or series of events that it seems like we want to avoid. But the scientific community, unfortunately, does not seem to be able to speak the language of public policy in such a way that either the, particularly the American general public or the world public policy community can actually take, first understand what you're saying, and secondly, take what you're saying and turn it into actionable policy change at the national and international level. So I wonder if you could take a stab at how we start creating some kind of global dialogue that's not just fact-finding, not just James Hansen screaming into the wind, which is a good thing. We need to understand. Okay, we got your point. Thank good. You. Thank you, Colin. Uh, and any students that have any questions, please raise them. We'd like to take a couple of questions because we only have a few minutes, but you have any other, any other students have any particular issues you'd like to bring up here regarding the environment? There's one. Hi, my name is John. I'm a graduate student in the School of Foreign Service. I want to first thank you all for taking your time to talk to us today. Um, you talked a lot about collaboration, and my question concerns the private sector. I think in, among some business people, collaboration is um, tantamount to giving away your business secrets, your business models. Um, the example I read recently is about electric chargers for cars. There's a lot of great technology out there, but Europe, America, and Japan are developing their own uh, systems, and they're not sharing information because it's giving away business secrets. Um, if this is true, what can we do to address this problem in the private sector? Thank you. Very good. So two questions so far. One is on the public policy issue. How do we convince the public that we should be more environmentally aware? And the second question, really, I think we can raise to the question of international standards. Is there some way that we can cooperate in developing international standards whereby it's not a, a competitive dynamic in protecting the environment, but it's rather a cooperative dynamic. So, Joanna, do you want to start on those if you want? Sure. Um, to the first question, I guess I would push back a bit on your, your point that it's the burden of the scientific community. I, I think that it's you're absolutely right that scientists are not always the best uh, sort of communicating the, what they're doing in lay terms to the broader public, right? But luckily, we have uh, an increasing number of organizations that are uh, positioning themselves to do just that here in the United States, where you're um, where you're speaking from, uh, as well as elsewhere, um, including many uh, think tanks, NGOs that I've worked with. Um, but I agree that there's there's quite a ways to go. Um, but I guess I would um, I would point out that in many ways the U.S. is unique in this regard in in terms of public opinion on climate change not necessarily lining up with the scientific consensus. Um, even you can go to China, uh, which you don't think of as the most, you know, environmentally, um, you know, forward moving country. Um, public opinion is uh, the public in China, according to surveys that have been done, is actually more worried about climate change than the, the U.S. general public. And of course, numbers in Europe and elsewhere are even much higher. So um, I think there's a lot of reasons why the U.S. Um, sort of dialogue is how it is, uh, which which we can talk about. Um, and on your on the question about um, private sector and competition, I think this is a really important point. Um, a, a lot of work that I do right now is looking at uh, U.S.-China collaborations in a variety of clean energy technology issues, um, particularly uh, one initiative facilitated by the U.S. government called the U.S.-China Clean Energy Research Center, which has been specifically designed to try to work through some of the intellectual property and other um, concerns related to clean energy technologies um, and set up a platform through which private sector can participate in this. And there's many uh, private sector uh, firms involved in this bilateral cooperation initiative to develop new technologies. And because you have an agreement that was signed um, by the two governments at a very high level um, about the way, the nature in, in which um, intellectual property is brought to the table and shared. Um, it's created a, a, a much more uh, constructive environment for, for collaboration, uh, for sharing of information, and um, ultimately for deploying technologies. Okay, um, I might uh, misunderstood your question, but uh, let me uh, just overview what happened to our last year, I say, about uh, the nuclear react nuclear policies, uh, because uh, when it comes to the public policy in Japan, uh, the 
direction, which direction those uh, ruling parties are uh, fe heading will be very important. Our, uh, due to the our ruling parties, our exchange happened last year, or at least uh, as far as our nuclear power plant policy is concerned, it's really changed from 180 degree, I would say. The previous ruling party, DPJ, um, they promised in their manifest that uh, during the 2030s, zero nuclear power plants. And uh, political leadership and also, I say, echo mind in those are our parties are, uh, it is okay, but when it really comes to implementation of actual environment policy, we wanted more support like at the event of the budget cut and so on. And I believe uh, those are previous, uh, I mean, former Prime Minister Hatoyama's uh, statement at the General Assembly with regard to the greenhouse gas emission reduction would be evaluated, highly evaluated to some extent. And so, uh, well I, sh I, well, I should be uh, very brief, but uh, uh, if, if I just give you one example, uh, in 2010, OECD made an environmental performance review of Japan, and uh, they really uh, give Japan are uh, really demanding recommendations, but uh, those uh, level was uh, almost the same as uh, our DPEJ uh, request. But then um, these DPJ I say failed to improve the economic situations and got less support from people. And then LDP became a new ruling party. And uh, while well, it's a, uh, it showed an overwhelming victory. And uh, as you know, the Prime Minister Abe put more weight on the economic uh, prosperity, uh, like uh, three alloys. And uh, well, before, uh, with regard to policy dialogue, we had, uh, are uh, several different methods, but in Japan, public comment, this is the most uh, commonly to occur policy dialogue process, but co public comment is not enough. So it's evolved to our next stage. They really uh, want uh, to getting those uh, citizens' voices, and they organize some or groups, and those head or chairman really come from the academic people, and they those are professors provide our scientific information and argue two, three days among our, the citizens and to, uh, they summarize their opinions and uh, those opinions are going to the cabinet. So the policy dialogue with those are, are general citizens is really increasing, but I would say it's in the process and uh, it will be more or evolve in, in, in the new future. Excellent, thank you. Okay. Email. Uh, <coughs> In my, in my opinion, so to have a cooperation from the uh, private sector, private companies, I think that strong government regulation is uh, necessary, important. Uh, under that um, uh, cons uh, assumptions, I think that uh, I'd like to mention about the CCS technology, as uh, Professor Joanna mentions. Uh, CCS is a carbon captured and storage technology. I think that's a quite promising technologies. Um, uh, for example, right now in Japan, uh, we are using um, thermal uh, power generations, maybe 80% or 90% of electricity are coming from the thermal or heat uh, power generations. Uh, so we emit a lot of CO2, but by using that technology CCS, we captured all of the CO2 and transport uh, the CO2 uh, to the uh, bottom of the sea, and uh, uh, we stretch it. Then we have no CO2 by using that technology. But to use that um, uh, systems, it costs a lot right now. I heard that it costs around 40 US dollars per CO2 tons, per tons. So um, if the government required uh, each company to pay uh, that cost, uh, if you emit a CO2, from the iron uh, or steel uh, production site or some other um, uh, factories, then a company will cooperate to uh, to because they want to uh, they do not want to pay uh, such a cost so much. Then uh, new technologies will arise. Uh, so uh, as a beginning, I think that we need a strong uh, government regulations to involve in uh, to have the cooperation from the private sector. That is my opinion. Very good. More questions from the students? Any questions? Any thoughts? Hi, my name is Jude from the uh, School of Continuing Studies. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, 
There is increasing coverage about the uh, radiation leak and the uh, radiation contamination of, uh, uh, from back in 2010, I believe, about uh, uh, contamination of uh, fisheries and the oceans. I was wondering what's being done or what are some of the options that are being assessed as to what to do about that situation? So uh, I think immediately we're talking about what is it, the ice wall? That is one of our options, which is a new technology. Um, maybe we could speak just briefly about that. If you've, you've, you've heard about that, where they're going to put down the, uh, the poles and they're going to fill them with cold water. And in that time, over time, they're going to ice that. And it's going to be a protection against the escaping water. Very, very difficult new technology, very expensive, never been done on a scale such as this. The other is the cement wall, is that correct? Actually, I have not much to say about that, but at the, as far as I, I understood her, well, there are always, sir, I mean, in every day, there's 300 tons of contaminated water, waters are uh, leaking to the ocean, and uh, there are about a thousand uh, tons of water or underground water surrounding those or, or nuclear power plant. But uh, out of our a thousand, these 300 contaminated waters are, are leaking to the to, to the oceans, and there are uh, the preventive measures be just sort of vacuuming or pumping up those uh, uh, contaminated waters. And uh, as much as uh, their plan is to as much as uh, more than half of those uh, 300 tons uh, should be pumping up. But still, they calculate that uh, 24, 24 tons of uh, contaminated water, water uh, might be leaking to the uh, ocean. And uh, well, there are several other negative news about the contaminated water, but I would like to stop now. I think the difficulty is that uh, with the water that's coming out, the fisheries, I believe some of the fishery associations have decided that they will no longer fish in that particular area. Um, so there, there's been quite a reaction across Japan. But keep in mind the scale of this. We haven't experienced the scale of this. Uh, the tsunami was a scale that we just didn't imagine. And so we're in sort of a new era here. Uh, just uh, in, in some ways it's a terrifying era, but there's a lot being done in Japan. Uh, but I think for this leakage that's left, there's two choices. And one of them is a cement wall, but the cement wall will take about a year to to establish, so it's a very difficult problem. So right now we're in a process, and uh, I believe the Abe government is perhaps taking a more directive state role uh, with the company right now, uh, so we know that change is going on. But it really brings up the nuclear power issue. Is this experience in Japan something that's going to change our minds globally about nuclear power? And of course, I mean, Joanna, you, the others here are much more attuned to this issue than I, but the alternative energies oftentimes demand a change in our economic practices and a change in our investment. And we go back to Colin's question there, are, has the public been convinced that we actually move, want to move in this direction? I find in Japan this nuclear power issue has come to a a debate in which the sides are so clear, the alternatives are so clear, it's, uh, to me, it's been a real education watching it. Um, so uh, any other questions, however, on these particular issues, on these uh, issues within Japan or issues of U.S.-Japan cooperation in terms of the environment or in terms of uh, some of these choices that we're making? Well, if not, could we go to the U.S.-Japan cooperation just for a minute? Sure. If you Actually, if I could just pick up on, on what you were just discussing. I mean, I think in many ways, one of the reasons why um, a lot of power system planners like nuclear energy is because it's a, it's a, a large-scale centralized um, power system in the way that many fossil and thermal power plants are, um, although there are some technology that could potentially be even smaller and more modular. Um, but a lot of these, when we talk about renewable energy technologies, um, the, the real 
comparison we're making here, it's not just about pollution and low carbon, but it's really about a different way of thinking about building out our power systems, whether we're sticking with this decentralized model that, that most of our countries use, where you have a few big power plants and a lot of transmission lines, um, or a decentralized model where you build smaller types of power stations closer to the demand. So um, I think one, one area where Japan has actually been an amazing um, success story has been in uh, rooftop solar panels. As you may know, there's been um, a very uh, successful program to promote the use of uh, solar panels on, on rooftops. And this, is, this goes against sort of this traditional centralized power system model because you're actually putting the power plant on your roof, right, as opposed to um, far away from where it's used. And, um, you know, I think this is worth thinking about not only because of the environmental benefits, which we usually talk about, but the security benefits associated with having electricity close to where you need it. Um, and a lot of countries, including China, and, um, are, as they're starting to scale up their renewables to very large um, portions of, the, of a certain grid area, for example, uh, I mentioned wind power in China is still only uh, less than 1% or so of electricity generation, but in a certain region, so for example in Inner Mongolia, um, at any instantaneous moment, wind power can actually be 50% of the electric grid. Um, and that causes all sorts of technical challenges for the operators because the wind's not always blowing, it's on, it's off, uh, the sun's not always shining, right? And so you have to think about how you're going to integrate these, uh, we call variable or, or intermittent uh, renewable energy sources in a predominantly centralized power system where planners are used to being able to turn the plants on and, and turn them off when we need them. Um, so these are the types of trade-offs. I think uh, you know, nuclear is very much a part of that. Um, whether we're sticking to this sort of large centralized model or these de decentralized models. Um, but just on, on your question about bilateral cooperation, um, I think there's a, a lot happening um, between uh, the U.S. and Japan, uh, including uh, new agreements that were just signed in July um, between our new Secretary of Energy, uh, Ernest Moniz, um, at the, the Department of Energy and uh, METI in Japan, uh, on a variety of energy technology issues, uh, including nuclear cooperation, climate change cooperation, uh, clean energy technologies, uh, as well as natural gas. Um, so these are the, the four areas that were highlighted for um, this round of bilateral cooperation, although, of course, there are, um, there are agreements going back for decades uh, between our two countries that have been, um, uh, many of which have produced a, a lot of really successful outcomes. Um, and so I think this is a place to pick up on. Um, and just one last point that was brought up earlier on the university, the university cooperation. I, I just didn't get a chance to uh, thank my colleagues for their suggestions. And, and I think that these are some really some good ideas to consider. Um, there's a lot of interest, I know, among our, our students on the Georgetown campus about looking for ways to um, make Georgetown a greener campus. And our, our Office of Sustainability is, is looking into um, a lot of new ideas, and I think there's probably a lot we could learn from uh, what's happening in Japan. Um, and in terms of student exchanges, uh, I think what's happening at SOFIA with all these very exciting uh, undergrad and graduate programs focusing on environment and, and green technologies could be a very uh, interesting way for some of our students, particularly who are studying science and technology and often don't get to go abroad because of the, the need to take these types of technical courses, which are often not offered in, in study abroad programs. And, and so this could be a potential opportunity for that type of student. Um, I think to expand uh, just on uh, Joanna's point there, by, by way of conclusion, we're kind of running out of time, but uh, the shale gas. And the shale gas has received a, a lot of attention in Japan, perhaps even more so than the United States. And one of the reasons is because of what jo uh, Joanna mentioned before, is uh, Japan's tremendous dependence on outside resources. Uh, the shale gas, if it's marketed at the price that they're talking about, would basically cut Japan's uh, price of gas imports by roughly one half. It would be a tremendous difference. In terms of U.S.-Japan cooperation, it would be moving the kind of alliance into another level. Uh, Japan already imports some oil from the United States, but the level would be uh, completely different. And of course, 
And the Japanese companies would also be contributing, as I understand, to the development of these shale gas resources. They are actually among the first companies that are making the investments here in the United States as it is opened up by the uh, Obama administration. Uh, this could be a, a, a tremendous difference in what we see now as the oil picture across the world in terms of the Middle East, the United States, and especially the countries in East Asia, which happen to be our, some of our closest allies and treaty partners, that is Korea and Japan, because both are uh, almost entirely energy dependent. The alternative, of course, is the Russian oil pipeline, and I believe the Russian oil pipeline uh, has gone down into China on one uh, swing and is still being discussed about going all the way over to Vladivostok, which would bring the oil down to Japan. So there is a global dynamic in terms of security that's going on that's very important, but it's in a dramatic moment of change right now, and in large part, not just because of uh, Russia and transporting gas from Russia, but because of the possibilities of this shale gas revolution. So. Perhaps in our next conference, in our next dialogue, this may be one of the areas that we're talking more about as this industry develops over the next six months or one year. I'd like to thank our panelists for the uh, discussion today, uh, particularly our Japanese guests who have come all the way from Japan and uh, are working here late in the afternoon despite the time change. I'd also like to thank you for your suggestions on cooperation between Sophia and Georgetown. And we have a number of our science professors here in the audience who will be picking up on a number of these issues. Um, and again, I'd like to thank uh, Sophia University for helping us to organize this and bring us together. Thank you very much. <laughs>